Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher. I'm founder of Simply Plant Based, where I've got a lot of programs to help you to change your health destiny. And tonight, I'm here with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, founder of the Barnard Medical Center, and author of like a plethora of books and articles. I mean, like, wow. May, I, I don't know. You say you go to bed at 10, but I don't know. I, mean, I don't think you sleep. <laughs> Anyway, Dr. Barnard, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me here tonight. Well, thank you, Jane. It's great to be with you again. Well, you know, we've done two of your books together, Power Food for the Brain and The Cheese Trap, and those both personally resonated with me, so powerful. But you have a new book called Your Body in Balance, and honestly, wow, I think this is your best yet, seriously. Oh, thank you. I, I do have to say that your body in balance touches on what for just about everybody I talk to is a completely new topic. They, they thought, well, if I'm going to go vegan, I, I have to be battling a weight problem or a high cholesterol or diabetes. And we're now touching on things that are so much more common and that people have kind of resigned themselves to. So I'm hoping that, that it will be helpful to people. I totally know it's going to be because it's blowing me out of the water. So we broke, I've broken up your book into a seven part series, and this is going to be part one of our seven part series. And it's going to be, the first part is on women's health, kind of like a few chapters from the owner's manual of women's health. So we're going to talk first about foods for fertility, because I know a lot of women are having trouble getting pregnant, either they're trouble conceiving or miscarrying. They are. And this is one area, uh, everything in your body and balance relates to hormones and how what things that we think are out of our control, amazingly enough, can be adjusted by foods. And I know it's an odd thought that if a person has infertility or cramps or endometriosis or, or even hormone-related cancers, people know that hormones play a role in all those things. Hormones can affect fertility and so forth. What they hadn't figured is that you could dial your hormones up or down based on your breakfast or your lunch or your dinner. And that is, it just gives us new tools that are safer than what people have had, and in many cases, much more effective. And, and when we think about the conditions that really trouble people, infertility is one where couples spend enormous, oh amounts, enormous amounts of money on diagnosis and evaluation, and then on various treatments that don't necessarily work. And Did along, you see that article in the New York Times um, about, about in vitro fertilization? Yes. And all the little pieces and how they like kind of nickel and dime you once you get into this. Oh, people are paying into six <gasps> figures for this over time. And, oh my and, gosh. and, and, and you, can under, you can understand what's going on. But to, if, if there are things that we can do with our foods and lifestyle that will dramatically undercut the infertility problem or improve fertility, it has a number of benefits, obviously apart from saving you from the medicalization of your life and all the expense. But for many couples, having a family is, has become something that is now a sterile medical exercise where you're looking at, at what does the thermometer say and, and did you take the medication right and da, 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 da. And our mind says, wait, stop. Let's just look at what the issues are and the surprising role that foods can play. Well, let's start off with fat cells, because I think people tend to have this idea that fat cells are just kind of like these blobs that are these little chunky things in your body, but they're actually busy hormone factories. And like the more fat you have, the more hormones they're going to produce. So how is this going to impact your hormone balance and fertility? That, that's exactly right. People think of, of the fat cells on your thighs or your stomach or where, wherever they might be, people just think of them, them as sort of inert calories. But fat cells are living, metabolizing cells. And what they do is they produce estrogens. Now, when I say estrogens, they are, that's the group of female sex hormones. And there are many of them. Estradiol is the main one in women, young women, up till the age of menopause. And then there's estrone and estriol. But, but here's the point. Let's say I've got a little bit more body fat. Whether I'm a woman or a man, those body fat cells want to make estrogens. And in a woman's body, they take whatever androgens or male sex hormones she may have in her body, and they take them and they run them through and start producing estrogens as a result. Now, here's the issue. A little bit of estrogen is normal in a woman's body. 
But if it's a huge amount, it starts goofing up her, her cycle. And if it can be an unpredictable amount, that makes it a problem too. So the more weight a woman acquires as time goes on, the more her uh, fat cells are cranking out estrogen. Uh, by, by the way, this is also true for men. Go to the beach, it's August, and you'll see some guys are taking their shirts off, and a heavy set guy who's got a little bit of breast development. That it's not is, a good look, not a good look. Well, um, w- what's it from? And you'll, sometimes you'll see on the internet, internet, what caused man boobs? You know, that's the term that people use for it. And they might think, well, is it soybeans? I gotta tell you, it's not soy. You can ask Hank at the beach, how much tofu have you had this week? And that is not his thing. What is happening is, as he's gained weight from burgers and bacon and cheese and so forth, his, his, his fat cells are making estrogens too. And so it's not just body fat that he's accumulating, it's actual breast tissue. So that's the result of eating foods that have caused weight gain. So that happens in men, but it happens in women. And when it happens in women, it, it will affect fertility. Okay, so being overweight is gonna impact fertility. So does being thinner, is that better? Is there like a sweet spot? Um, uh, there, yes, uh, thinner is better, but, but yes, there is a sweet spot because while you don't wanna to be too heavy, you also don't wanna be overly thin because if a woman is really, really thin, the ovarian function can just shut right down. And so uh, this is where sometimes uh, runners, marathon runners, yeah. will have fertility issues. By the way, it's, it's not because they're physically active. Physical activity is no problem with regard to fertility or having a good cycle. It's a question of her getting too thin and just losing. You know, nature says you ought to have, you ought to have some body fat. You don't want to have none. Okay. So the sweet spot, if you calculate your BMI, and if you haven't done this, you go online, there's lots of BMI calculators, body mass index. Plug in your height, you plug in your weight, and it'll tell you where in the range you are. And here are the numbers. A healthy, what we consider a healthy BMI is between 18 and a half and 25. And so that's what we're going to say is the range for not having too high a risk of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. But for fertility, we want to be within that window, but at the lower end of it, somewhere around 19, 20, 21, somewhere in there. That's where fertility is at its maximum. Uh, When you start to go even up to a 24, 25, it's not quite as good. And getting up to 30 and 35, it's greatly impaired. But once you're down to 17, 16, you're too thin. And you're, and you're going to have higher... That's not happening in my family. <laughs> right. no, um, but, but, but you know what I'm talking about. So, so, is there a sweet, so is, is there a sweet spot? Yes. Somewhere around 19 to 21, somewhere in there. Now, this doesn't mean that a person should feel bad if you're 24 and a half. I mean, that, that is a, what we would consider the healthy BMI range. And so it's not like fertility is tremendously impaired at, at, that, at that range. Okay. Well, if excess hormones can cause problems with fertility... What can you do? How can you get rid of them? Can we get rid of them? Can we get rid of excess hormones? Yes. The body does that all the time. Your liver is filtering your blood. And as it does so, it pulls things out that don't belong there. You know, your, your liver is trying to see what's not you. Uh, for example, if you take medication, the liver will say, what's that doing there? And so ma- many medications are actually pulled out by the liver. But so is estrogens. So the liver will filter the blood. It will find excess estrogens. It sends them through a little tube called the bile duct into the intestinal tract, and you literally flush those estrogens away. Does it help with fiber? You guessed it. Let's say a person had zero fiber foods. They had chicken breast, salmon, Velveeta, anything anything from an animal. It, It does not have fiber. Fiber is only in plants. So you put your finger on exactly the issue here. Let's say a person's liver is filtering the estrogen out, it goes down the bile duct into the intestinal tract, ready to be flushed away, except there has to be fiber in the intestinal tract to grab a hold of it and to carry it out. If there is not fiber in the intestinal tract, those estrogens are reabsorbed through the wall of the intestine back into the bloodstream, and they end up eventually working their way back to the liver. And the liver says, what's this? I thought you were in the intestinal tract. The liver will actually take the very same estrogen molecules and send them back down the bile duct and they keep going around and around and around in this cycle. It's called enterohepatic circulation. So the thing that stops it is fiber. If you have lots of fiber in your diet, then you literally can't flush the estrogens away. If you can't, what you're gonna, if you're not having fiber in your diet, your estrogen levels rise. Well, uh, how much fiber are we talking here? The average American gets roughly 15 grams, 16 grams a day. That's not very much. Some people 12, 10. 
very low. But I would argue, I would, most health authorities will say push for 25 or 30. I would argue 40 or even higher. To get there, it means skipping the meat taco, having the bean burrito or the bean chili or something like that. The legume group, beans, peas, lentils, those are the fiber champions. Number two comes in with vegetables, whether you're looking at the starchy root vegetables like carrots or green leafy vegetables like broccoli or Brussels sprouts. Uh, number three, the fruit group, all, all of them, very high in fiber. And then finally, whole grains come in, like brown rice and so forth. If these are the foods that you're eating, you're gonna get plenty of fiber. If on the other hand, you're consuming animal products, they crowd the fiber out and they, and they don't have any fiber of their own. So animal products, no fiber. Animal products, have, have, they don't have fiber. Fi fiber is plant roughage. And over the millennia, human beings eating an essentially herbivorous diet had lots of fiber. And so the body relied on that. Said, okay, how are we gonna get rid of excess estrogens? Easy, just put them in the intestinal tract because you're eating fiber, it's gonna carry them away. Nature never thought that we would be having meaty, cheesy, diets because when we do it disables the the system that we need for eliminating excess hormones and for somebody who's eating that they're not eliminating them uh, and it causes all kinds of problems obviously constipation and, and so forth but your intestinal tract is a way to eliminate the things that your body feels are should be re removed and hormones are part of it so, so, so the whole idea is, you talked about a sweet spot for weight, there's also a sweet spot for hormones. And so you, you need some estrogens, if you're a woman and you wanna be fer fer fertile, but you don't, want, you don't want a truckload. So your body will find that sweet spot naturally if you have a normal, low-fat, plant-based, high-fiber diet. Awesome, yeah. So share with us the studies at Tufts University, UCLA, and the American Foundation. What did they do and what were the results? Yeah, actually, this goes way back. Everything we've been talking about with fiber was not there initially. It wasn't really investigated for fertility. It was investigated for cancer. Women with breast cancer were known to be, frankly, vulnerable to anything that increases estrogens. Estrogen stimulates the growth of cancer cells. It can even initiate the cancer process. So researchers back in the 80s and 90s started looking at, well, how can I reduce estrogens in a, in a woman's body to protect her from cancer? So at, at Tufts, at the American Health Foundation, at the UCLA, and, and some other places too, researchers brought in women who volunteered to be in the study, and they started manipulating parts of their diet and measuring the amount of estrogens in their blood, and they found something interesting. We talked about fiber. Mm -hmm. If you increase the fiber in a woman's diet by just having beans and, and vegetables and fruits and so forth on a regular basis, what you discover is that her ability to remove the estrogens improves right away and her estrogen level moderates into the healthy range. You do the opposite. Put fatty foods into her diet, really any kind of fat, but the more fat there is, what you see is her estrogen levels will rise in an unhealthy way. Now, we know why fiber reduces estrogens because it, it carries the estrogens away, it flushes them away. We don't know why fat has that opposite effect, at least I don't know why. I haven't been able to figure out why fat elevates estrogens. But what we do know is that they act independently. If you're having a healthy plant-based vegan diet, but you decide to suddenly go out and have lots of fried foods and lots of grease, your estrogen levels will be unhealthy or more likely to be unhealthy. And if you take the fat out of your diet, it's gonna come back down. If you're following a plant-based diet, but it's all white bread, fiber depleted foods, bring the fiber in and that will help too. Best of all, do both. Avoid the fat, pump up the fiber. Nice, okay. Yep. Well, another threat to fertility comes from dairy products. What's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, dairy products, they, they don't have fiber. Obviously, they're, they're from an animal. They are high in calories. The number one nutrient in cheese or butter or milk is, is fat. The number two nutrient in milk is sugar, lactose sugar. And so you're getting a lot of unnecessary calories. You're going to tend to gain weight. That can be part of the problem as well. But the other thing is that cows, cows are, are females. They make estrogen. The estrogens get into the milk, and so the pail that is, or the tubes or whatever it is that is removing 
the milk from the cow through the milking system carry traces of estrogens with them, and it ends up in milk. Now, it's only a trace. However, the cow is impregnated, but all dairy cows are artificially inseminated every year, and so the cow is pregnant, and they're milked during their pregnancy. And if you track during the pregnancy, the amount of estrogen in the cow's bloodstream goes up and up and up and up and up and up, and then the amount in the milk goes up too. It's still only a trace, but as the milk is converted to cheese, the hormones go with the fat. Is it bioaccumulative? Uh, that is a great question. I am going to say probably not. If, if by bioaccumulative, do you mean, does it stay in your fat stores? Right. Uh, you, you could think that it, w- it would because when you take milk and you remove the water and the lactose sugar and so forth, and you're left with, with cheese and butter, the estrogens do tend to go with the fat. But I, am, I don't know the answer to that, but I am going to doubt that the amount of estrogen really builds up in body fat. The body fat makes it. And we'll store it to a degree, but I'm going to, it's not like dioxin or something like that where it, 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 uh, it's, it stores up. But don't quote me on that, but I believe that's the case. Okay. But here's the, here's, the, here's the point. Cows make estrogens. It's, it's, it's basically the only food that's going to have pre-made estrogens in it. So the, the, the traces of estrogens in milk are concentrated in cheese. It's still not much. But as I think we actually talked about this on an earlier program, that women with breast ca- previously diagnosed with breast cancer, who eat a lot of cheese or other, any other high-fat dairy, their risk of dying of their cancer is dramatically increased. There was a study in California showing that those consuming the most high-fat dairy products had about a 49% higher risk of dying of their breast cancer compared to other, other women. So that, what that oh, is, gosh. yeah, oh yes. This is presumably because of the estrogen traces. It's only a trace, but those little traces can do a lot of mischief. So if it's a question of fertility, Dairy products, we believe, are a big part of the problem. Oh, my God. Well, what about what Daniel Kramer did? What did he yes. find? Oh, yeah, Dan Kramer was, he did some fascinating research. He started looking at dairy products and fertility. And he looked at, at a variety of countries. Uh, Thailand, for example. Not much dairy is consumed there. And fertility was very high. But specifically, he looked into the change in fertility as a woman goes through year by year. Between, say, the late 20s and the late 30s, for many women, their fertility declines, which is why you hear people saying, you know, you you don't want to wait too long to raise your family because your chances of pregnancy are not as good. Between the late 20s, late 30s, fertility often declines. In Thailand, where there's not much dairying, during that interval, the decline in fertility was maybe 25%, something like that. But if you look at Brazil, a little bit more, considerably more dairy consumption, decline in fertility was much higher. You look at the United States, it was around 80%. I mean, a huge drop. New Zealand, big dairy country, same story. 80%? Oh, yes. In other, in other words, wow. um, women, women have assumed that the loss of fertility that occurs as you go from 28 to 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, this is just nature's biological clock. Maybe. It could be Dairy Queen's biological clock, where the, the dairy products are interfering with fertility. Because when you put, and Kramer did this, you put all the countries on a map. And it's not perfect, but you do see the more milk there is in the diet, the more, the, the more rapid the loss of fertility. But I gotta tell you, Gene, in this case, he was not saying it's because the dairy products make you overweight and that, and that the fat will cause the estrogen production. He was not saying that it's because dairy doesn't have fiber in it or is loaded with fat. He was picking on something completely different It was the milk sugar, lactose. Mm -hmm. Lactose is famous for lactose intolerance. It's what makes people sick to their stomach in some cases after drinking milk. But what he was looking at, and and this is important, lactose is a sugar. It's a double sugar, a disaccharide. In your digestive tract, assuming you can digest it, it breaks apart, liberating galactose, galactose and glucose. The galactose, is toxic to the ovary. At least that's what Kramer believes. And there aren't very many, sho- many foods with galactose in them. The big one is milk and milk products. So the, the, uh, the person drinks milk, they think, oh, I need this for, for good health. Uh, well, so I think boats. we've been marketed to, you know, we've been brainwashed to think right. we have to have this. 
I mean, I grew up drinking, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That was what we had. We went through gallons of milk right. at our dinner table. Right. And the result is weight gain and you're, and you're, you're drinking in the estrogens and all that kind of stuff. But you're also drinking in a huge amount of lactose, which in your digestive tract breaks down to release galactose. Here's the problem. The galactose is linked to infertility, but the, we believe that it's toxic to the ovary. And so researchers have also looked at what's worse than infertility. And that's ovarian cancer, a uh, uh, very fatal cancer. And it goes right up with milk consumption. So the more you, you we've, we've, I think we've talked about this with regard to prostate cancer. The more milk men drink, the higher the risk of prostate cancer, but it is also true for women and ovarian cancer. Now, let me be clear. I think we need more research on this to really nail it down for sure. But the evidence is looking like those women who avoid milk just don't hit. You, you follow nature's advice, which said, drink mother's milk until the age of weaning and then no milk at all. It's certainly not from a cow or another animal, obviously. Well, um, after, you're after consuming that. the lactating fluid of another species. Right. You, We're you, the you, only species yeah. that's doing this. We, and because we grew up with it, we, we accept it as normal. But Mother Nature scratches her head saying, don't do that. That's why I invented weaning. But here's the point, that the women who avoid dairy tend to retain fertility longer and have a lower risk of ovarian cancer. So, as I say, I think we do need more research on, on this. but we know more than enough now to avoid dairy products and, and people who are eager to improve their fertility would do well to set the dairy products aside. Well, what about people that are lactose intolerant? I mean, isn't this actually how we should be? Yes, you know, I, it's, it's the craziest story. Up until the mid 1960s, people thought, gastroenterologists thought that lactose intolerance was rare. And okay, the occasional person will have some ice cream or they'll drink milk and they get sick. They get diarrhea and bloating and they feel, they feel terrible. But that's really rare. Oh, is it? Well, what happened in the 1960s, researchers started testing larger groups of people. And what they discovered is that in whites, it is fairly uncommon. The older you get, the more likely it can happen, but it's still only maybe, oh, I don't know, 10, 15% of the population. The other people digest the lactose, no problem. However, if you look at African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, or Africans, Asians, pe people, all other races all around the world, lactose intolerance is the rule. Starting at around age six, people gradually lose their ability to digest the milk sugar, which is what nature had in mind. You're not breastfeeding anymore. What, what should you need? Why should you need the lactase enzymes that digest cow's milk? Um, so that's actually the rule, and that protects us because you're not going to drink milk because it's going to make you feel rotten. And so you are not going to be ingesting those estrogens and so forth. Now, the problem is there's a whole industry to try to push milk on you. So they'll make products that are enzymatically treated to break the lactose apart in the carton. The problem with that is that that liberates the glucose and galactose right in the milk carton. So you're drinking the galactose with every glass of the lactose-free milk. Oh, that, oh my God. Along with the estrogens and the other things that are in it. So if it comes out of a cow, just set it aside. Oh my gosh. So being lactose intolerant, that's how we're supposed to be. Yes, and that is true not only for the vast majority of humans, but for all mammalian species. They, they get milk when they're an infant from their mom. You know, calves become lactose intolerant. You know, they're, they, they drink milk from mom, but what, once they're, wean and they're eating solid food, a calf becomes lactose intolerant. <laughs> what happened, the reason that many whites are not is there is a genetic mutation that occurred in dairy and communities. And you can imagine how this might happen during times of, of famine. Those people who could actually maybe access dairy products temporarily, they might survive. And so there's a mutation that many whites carry that allows them to make this uh, enzyme called, S, uh, called lactase for a longer period of time. That's a, over, over the long term, a real disadvantage because it means they're going to subject themselves to the problems of dairy, thinking, well, I, can, I don't get digestive symptoms. Nothing's going to hurt me. The problem is it increases the risk of cancer and infertility and all kinds of other problems. Oh my gosh. Well, can estrogens that are in dairy products, can they affect men's reproductive biology? Uh, yes. Amazing study. There are a couple of, uh, of interesting studies done in Rochester, uh, New York, where researchers, first they looked at college students 
and they, they tracked their dairy consumption. You know, college students, another slice of cheese, please, more pizza and whatever, you know. And what they found was that the more dairy products they consumed, the lower, uh, the worse their sperm counts. You can, you can look at sperm absolute number. You can look at motility, meaning how they move, or morphology, just the shape. And what you discovered is that the more dairy these kids consume, the more all of those things are, are not normal. And then looking in a fertility clinic, it has been shown also that the more cheese the men are eating, those are the ones who have the worst sperm counts. So what this raises is a hypothesis that the traces of estrogens in cheese and other dairy products, but especially in cheese, because they're more concentrated, that those traces, small as they may be, are more than enough to affect something as delicate as the growth of a breast cancer cell in, in a woman's body or the production of sperm in a man's body. And it, it is true that the amounts are very small and people who argue that are, are right, but nature already gave you all the estrogens that you're supposed to have. And so if you start dribbling in a little bit more, the hypothesis is that's what's causing problems. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Well, but think about how, also how many men have ever heard of this? None. There are so many guys that are going to the fertility center saying, I don't know what's wrong. And nobody ever told them it could be the, the cheese you're eating. Well, how much do I have? Just a, maybe a serving or two a day. The average man is consuming 35, 36, 37 pounds of it a year. And it's a, it's a hormonal drug. Well, it is a drug, please. I mean, we talked about this in the cheese <laughs> trap. I mean, like I was caught right in that center bullseye, you know, until I read that book and went, no, <laughs> not no more. So, no. well, what about exercise? Can this help with fertility? Surprisingly, yes. I, I hinted at this earlier. When people, when women exercise, their fertility is improved. And as a matter of fact, I, and by the way, I don't mean just kind of trudging around. I mean vigorous exercise, getting down on your bike, running a marathon, all that is fine for fertility. We have all heard, as I mentioned earlier, of people who are training for a marathon and they might lose their ovulatory cycle, they lose in their periods. That's not really because of the vigorousness of the exercise, we don't believe. We think that's thinness. Her body fat content has just gotten so low that it's interfering with fertility. So as long as you're in that sweet spot of weight, have at it. Vigorous exercise is good for fertility. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Let's say the magic day happens. You get that little test strip and it's, yay, it's yes. the right color. Woohoo. Okay. <laughs> you're pregnant. Right. Morning sickness. Oh my God. I remember to this day how, I mean, I think I lived on crackers and, and ginger ale, you know, some ginger kind of things. Right. To, to get me through. What is going on with morning sickness? Yeah. Peculiar thing. You know, why is it that when a woman is, is at a time when, when her diet affects herself and affects her baby, why should she be throwing up and feeling rotten and so forth? What's that, what's that all about? The, the diet that, that is often prescribed is the brat diet. They have bananas, have rice, have applesauce, have, have tea and toast. That's brat. What you, what you first notice is that all those foods are rather bland, plant-based foods. Researchers have looked into this and a theory has evolved that's a fascinating theory. When a woman is pregnant, the baby is only half her DNA. The other half is her partner's DNA. And that's foreign DNA, if I can put it that way. So progesterone in the woman's body weakens the immune system a little bit so that she doesn't reject her baby. Well, if her immune system is weak, is weakened to, to, so that she doesn't reject her baby, this means she's also more vulnerable to bacterial infections or all kinds of things that could hit her during pregnancy. So the theory, and I emphasize theory because it's hard to know, but, but all the evidence points to this. The theory is that she is now going to be her brain will be especially attuned to potential threats. So if she eats meat, meat is quite often contaminated with fecal bacteria like salmonella or E. coli. And so meat is one of the big triggers for morning sickness. And so the brat diet 
safe foods like bananas and rice and applesauce and that kind of thing. So he, here's the point, that morning sickness is thought to be a defense against bacterial infections so that you're turned off by and nauseated by foods that could be contaminated. So that is a theory. And Catherine Lawrence, who is a person who actually I mentioned in the cheese trap because she was a person who had developed an endometriosis but got rid of it by getting away from cheese and animal products. She, uh, she sent me a follow-up message, which I included in Your Body in Balance. After she got her fertility t- together and felt great, she discovered that with her third child, she had loosened her diet a little bit and she developed morning sickness. And she thought, good heavens, let me go back to a completely healthy, low-fat, completely vegan diet. And her morning sickness was just stopped immediately. So it's a fascinating turn on this, but we believe that morning sickness is there to protect the body by rejecting unhealthy, potentially contaminated foods. Wow. Yeah, well, can you believe part, it? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I wish <laughs> I had known this back in the day. That would have helped a lot. Well, so. what, 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 what this means is, is for a woman who is pregnant, if, if you haven't gone vegan before, go vegan now. It's the healthiest thing for you and your baby. When you look at, at complications in vegan pregnancies, they're dramatically lower than in omnivorous pregnancies. Now, your whole family's going to worry because they want to make sure you're getting plenty of protein and so forth. You, you have to respond to them. You have to respond to your family and say, yes, I am eating for two, but one of us is very small. It's not, this is not Arnold Schwarzenegger you know, trying to bulk up with steak. <laughs> so it's the amount of added nutrition during pregnancy is really quite modest. And a, a healthy plant-based diet, along with your prenatal vitamins, which include B12 and so forth, that's all important. That is the healthiest thing that you can have. It also reduces the light, we believe, the likelihood of gestational diabetes and complications. So what we think is it also is likely to reduce morning sickness. Well, Harvard researchers compared the diets of 44 women who had serious morning sickness. What did they come up with? Yeah, what we believe is going on is that the diets that are particularly high in saturated fat, this is, again, the meaty diet, is really a big driver of it. And what we really found is that there are women who really just don't have nausea during pregnancy. And those are the women who have the healthiest diets. Wow. Okay. Let's change tracks a little bit and go on to curing cramps and premenstrual syndromes. Right. I mean, we've talked a lot about estrogen. What role does the estrogen play in the menstrual cycle? Okay. This is actually what started me off, and this is the whole reason I wrote Your Body in Balance. I was sitting right here at this desk 25 years ago, something like that, and the phone rang, and it was a young woman who had cramps, and she wanted painkillers to, she, she had to take a trip, a business trip, and she said, I just can't function. And so I said, fine, I can give you some painkillers for a couple of days. But here's what hit me, and what I realized is important. I think, so what causes cramps? The uterus. The uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month, it thinks we're going to get pregnant for sure. So what happens is the amount of estrogen gradually rises and it thickens the endometrium. That's the lining of the uterus. And then uh, towards the end of the month, the disappointed uterus discovers that we're not pregnant again. So it, it discharges that endometrial lining. That's what menstrual flow is. And then the next month, it starts again. The lining thickens up. And then with menstrual flow, it's discharged. If a woman's body has too much estrogen in her blood, that will cause too much thickening of that endometrial layer. And towards the end of the month, that endometrial layer starts producing maladjusted chemicals called prostaglandins that cause crampy pain. And so as she was telling me her symptoms and asking me for painkillers, I thought, I'll give you painkillers. But if you have extra estrogen in your blood causing too much thickening, of your endometrium, you're gonna have pain next month again because that thickening uh, endometrial lining is producing all these prostaglandins that are gonna cause cramps. So I thought, how how are we gonna reduce the amount of estrogen in your blood? Cut the fat, boost the fiber, as we were talking about earlier, see what happens. So I said to her, how about this? Would you like to try an experiment next month, next for, for the next 30 days, 28 days? No animal products at all, no cheese, no meat, nothing all the vegetables and fruits and beans and whole grains, and keep oils really low because we wanted to really cut the fat. And she found that her next period arrived with zero symptoms. 
And that continued month after month until she loosened her diet. Now you can loosen your diet by bringing animal products in, you can loosen your diet by bringing grease, vegetable oil in, either way, the cramps are gonna come back for a lot of people. So anyway, when this helped her, I thought that's important, but we need to do a study. So we did, uh, by we, I mean my colleagues at uh, Georgetown University's Department of OBGYN, we worked together and did a research study where we brought in a large group of women and they all had cramps, moderate to severe cramps. And for some of them, fistfuls of ibuprofen couldn't really get them functioning well. And There's nothing worse, honest to God. I mean, you, don't, you haven't experienced it, but I'm telling you. <laughs> I, well, I'm gonna take your word for it because, anyway, so, so what we did is that the women were randomly assigned to either a healthy, low, very low fat plant-based diet or to a supplement that was effectively a placebo. And what we found was that the placebo didn't do much. Anybody who tells you that placebos are great painkillers, they can be overrated. When you've got disabling cramps, your placebo is like not gonna help. But what we discovered was that the plant-based diet did several things. The first thing was as their periods approached, we looked at PMS symptoms. And that was amazing. We looked at, at physical symptoms like bloating, water retention, and we discovered that was reduced and then mood changes and, and what, we, what I'm gonna call broadly uh, behavioral changes were, were reduced as well. But then when their periods hit, there was less pain and shorter. The, the, the number of days of pain was reduced. So instead of it being three days or four days, it was cut to, by, by day three it was gone. And the intensity of it was, was greatly reduced. Now, now the effect varied depending on how, how women follow the diet and, and maybe other factors too. But for some women, it just stops their pain. And oh, I gotta tell you, I, I, I don't think I told you this, Jane, but I need to tell you. Uh, when I wrote Your Body in Balance, in fact, let me show you. There is- There it is. Uh, Lindsay, Nixon, Lindsay S. Nixon is at the bottom. I, I asked Lindsay to write the recipes for it because- And she, she always does amazing, she, I should say. She does an amazing job. And, and she came through with fabulous recipes, which are, which are great. And, and if you buy this for no other reason other than the recipes are great. However, Lindsay sent me the recipes, which are wonderful, along with a note saying, I got to tell you that when she herself had gone vegan, her longstanding problem with menstrual cramps just was basically solved for her. So I thought, how, I mean, for how many other women is this the case where you're being just punished? month after month, year after year after year, never realizing that the foods that we've grown up with, that we were told to eat, have meat for protein, have dairy for calcium, um, that these are the foods that are causing our hormones to get dialed in the wrong direction, causing your uterine function to change, ovarian function to change, causing infertility, causing cramps, causing all kinds of, of problems. And that seems to be the case. Now, a woman could put this to work. All the side effects are good ones. They're great ones. Right. They're amazing. Weight, weight, weight loss and lower cholesterol and lower blood pressure and everything. And else. you feel so good. I think, yeah. you know, for me, I just see so many people in pain, you know, just chronic pain that they're living with and they can't move. They, it's hard for them to do that. Yes. I mean, and, and, lo and loss of brain function. When we talk, for me, that's my biggest fear, honestly. I, I, I dread if I, you know, go down that path. I'm doing everything that I can, reading books like Power Food for the Brain to make sure that my brain's getting everything that I need. But no, I, I think just to see so many people in pain and just not feeling good. And when it's so easy to just switch to this. And, and you know, there's, a, there's another rather insidious thing is that people are told it's their fault, um, which is really kind of a creepy thing. And, and we see this with endometriosis as well, which- Well, that was my next question. Oh, what okay. Is that? All right, so. well, well, endometriosis is, is a common cause of pain. What, what's, what we believe has happened, well, what we know has happened is that if, if you look into your abdominal cavity, what you see are little globs of cells that are supposed to be inside the uterus. It's that endometrial lining, those cells have somehow gotten out of the uterus and they're implanting all around the abdomen. And what we believe is happening is that they have escaped up the fallopian tubes and are now spilling out in the abdominal cavity. So they can attach anywhere in the abdominal cavity and they swell and they can cause pain, particularly as the menses arrives. 
but they can attach to the, the intestinal tract. So you have pain all month long, and when a woman goes to the bathroom, then, oh, it's like it, it really hurts much more. It can cause sexual problems, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so here's, here's what I was getting at. Uh, a woman's got endometriosis. She has pain every month. She is told by her well-meaning, ill-informed friends that that's just the curse of being a woman. When people get their diet back in gear, very often they discover that there was never anything wrong with them. It was, it was food, foods that were part of the culture that were hurting them. It's the food. Yeah. It's the food. In, in, in a great many cases. Now, there, there could be chemicals that contribute to it, or maybe there's a gen genetic part. But for so many people, um, when they get onto a healthier diet, the likelihood of developing endometriosis diminishes, but also there's a chance of, of improving it or getting rid of it. Well, what about fibroids? You know, what are they? And can diet help for this too? Yeah, there are a couple of other uh, conditions that they are also estrogen dependent. A fibroid is in the wall of the uterus. The, the, the wall of the uterus, the, inside, the, inside the wall of the uterus is a big layer of muscle. And there can be uh, muscle knots forming and that's a fibroid and it can be big as a tennis ball. Um, now, a lot of women have really tiny fibroids, no big issue, but for some women, they, they, can, they do grow and they can cause pain and cause other problems as well, and it's the biggest reason for, for, um, for hysterectomies. There's a, there's a related condition called adenomyosis, and this will not be on the test, but, but what it is, it's the, that endometrial lining. Now, those cells are now finding their way, they're sneaking into little implants inside that muscle layer. It's, it's like endometriosis, but it's, instead of being all around the abdomen, they're embedding inside the muscle layer. And, and they're a common cause of pain, too. But, but, the, the, here, but here's what all of these things that we've been talking about during this, this program, they all are estrogen dependent. So that after menopause, fibroids start to go away. That's a sign that estrogens have been growing them. So if we can be on a healthy, high fiber, low fat, plant based, diet, we're not putting the fuel on the fire. Well, is that going to help with menopause too? We believe so, yes. And when I say we believe so, frankly, I think of all the conditions, I think that with menopause, I think it's the least understood. But here's what, here's what we found. First of all, if you simply observe different populations, in Japan, before westernization, before McDonald's ever set up shop in Tokyo. The diet was largely based on rice and noodles and, and meat when it was consumed was just little bits as a kind of a flavoring. There was no word for hot flashes and women didn't report them. And you thought, well, maybe they're just being reticent and they don't want to describe it. Gynecologists have looked into this and studied it. And when women were going through menopause, they would re report sometimes some backache minor symptoms, but hot flashes weren't really a big thing. Then, after westernization, things gradually changed and hot flashes became fairly commonly reported. Um, what we think is happening is that we're driving up the amount of estrogen in a woman's body, getting her body attuned to this high estrogen level, and then in menopause, it all comes crashing down and she goes effectively into withdrawal. So that's what we think is happening. That's a hypothesis, but it, it fits. And you see this in many populations that westernize. And so in the United States, where the diet is meaty, cheesy, that's a high uh, estrogenic type of diet. It boosts estrogen levels in the blood and then sets you up for crashing and burning then when you get to menopause. Well, that's why we do the hormone replacement therapy, kind of to stabilize it so you're uh, not having this crash and burn. Dangerous Band-Aid. No. Uh, it, it, what hormones will do is they'll, they will replace what what is no longer there. However, what you're really doing is deferring the, for some people, the hot flashes. When, when you wean off of the hot flashes, very often come back. The other thing is that hormone replacement therapy can increase cancer risk um, and, and the risk of a lot of other things. It also suggests that nature had menopause as a mistake. And let me say menopause is not a mistake. There, there are once in a while, you hear a person who say that, well, menopause just is a sign that you've, oh, you've lived past your sell by date. You weren't supposed to live past age 50. Uh, 200 years ago, women didn't live to be 50. And so it's, this is just, we're living too long. And to that, I say, hooey. That is ridiculous. For there have always been women who've lived a long period of time. 
um, the reproductive window in nature would be between roughly age 20 and age 40, 45, something like that, because estrogenic changes are dangerous. And plus, once you're 50 or 60, this is not a time to have a toddler on your kitchen floor anyway. So no, the <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so the reproductive window is relatively short, and and just as men are key, the, the onset of of fertility is a normal process. Menopause is also a completely normal process. It doesn't mean you're old. It it just means that's it. Now we're going to go on. You got lots of other stuff that you're going to be doing now, other than getting pregnant. Totally, yeah. completely, completely normal. And I'm going to argue that hot flashes are not a normal part of this. And, and taking estrogens to try to make up for what nature forgot to give you is not part of it either. Right. I mean, you're shutting down the factory. Pink slips are being given out. You're sh closing down the factory. We're done. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But right. also, too, I mean, I just think about it in terms of, like, evolution. I mean, why would you have this happening within a body to shut down when you still have a lot more years. I think it was to help the next generation to give them your time to help raise them successfully. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting point, and I, and I think I think it's right. I mean, do grandparents, does an extended family improve the survival of the family? Obviously it does. And if they're busily raising new newborns themselves, it, it's not so effective. So it's, it's, a, it's a theory, but it's a very compelling one. Well, you mentioned that having a plant-based protein in the morning as a mood stabilizing effect, how, how does this work? This is the first I'm hearing about this. Do it's tell. A, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing, and it's simply something that I have observed, and I don't know of studies that have, have done it, but, but if, let's say you're feeling moodiness, or for a woman who's in her reproductive years, she's got some PMS, or a person's uh, just kind of lapsing in and out of depression a little bit, you, what you might try is, in addition to a completely plant-based diet, have a little bit of plant protein early in the day and early in the meal. Here's what I mean. Uh, you're starting off your breakfast. Have some, say, uh, uh, grilled uh, tempeh or something like that, or some tofu. Or, or, or in, in just about every country other than the U.S., beans are a common part of the breakfast. In England, it's baked beans. In, in uh, Mexico, it might be black beans or whatever. In uh, the Middle East, it might be hummus or chickpeas. But what, what you're doing is you're trying to build a little extra protein, plant protein, early in the day and also early in the meal. So that doesn't mean you can't have something starchy like toast or like oatmeal, but have that as the second part of the meal. And what many women discover, and, and men too also notice, is that their mood is just kind of evened out a little bit. And what we think is going on is that if you have a high carb, very high carbohydrate meal, your brain makes extra serotonin. And the serotonin can make you feel kind of sleepy and a little bit off and not on your game. And a high protein meal will block that. If it's animal protein, then you've got all kinds of other problems that go along with it and it does not tend to improve moods. It's, it doesn't have any fiber and throws things off. But the plant proteins, tempeh, tofu, the legume group, or even a glass of soy milk, for many people, they discover that it has a mood stabilizing effect. So don't take my word for it. Give it a try. How about soy yogurt? Would that do it? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it would have the same effect. The idea is simply to have those protein grams from a plant source teed up and early in the day. <clears throat> well, I noticed just myself personally, if I have, I start my day out with oatmeal mm -hmm. and I have berries and other things with it, I, I'm like ravenous all day. Like, I just, I don't know, I just like, I'm, I become like this eating machine. But if I start out with something savory, you know, and I didn't even think about it in terms of being protein, maybe, you know, that helps to calm it. I don't know. We'll see. But I, I encourage people just give it a try and see, and, and see what happens. Now, of course, people take this in the wrong direction with animal protein. So they're having bacon and sausage and all of these things end up causing a lot more harm than good. But you can have the benefit with plant proteins and and uh, see if it works for you. All right. Well, Dr. Barnard, I thank you so much for taking the time out of your, I know, a very busy day to connect with me. And I, I can't wait for part two. Well, Jean, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for including me in the program.